The early 20th century was a transformative time for the world, a time when industrialization brought nations unprecedented periods of growth and globalization. And with growth and globalization comes the inevitable cancer in the form of nationalism. With the rise of nationalism came the rise of its sister ideologies, ideas rooted in nativist and racial thought. Ethno-nationalism grew in the historically multicultural United States, just as it did everywhere else in the world. These ideas precipitated changes in immigration law. Immigration law which, despite an ugly legacy with regards to the Chinese Exclusion Act, remained relatively open for most of American history. Between the years of 1880 to 1914, some 25 million people, primarily from Europe, had immigrated to the United States, with only about a 1% rejection rate for health reasons. However, such laissez-faire immigration policies caused racial and ethnic rifts. Groups of people who were seen as an other collided with the nativist philosophy of Manifest Destiny. These tensions brought about many unfounded beliefs about those who immigrated, and with the rapid growth of nationalist ideals across the world, violence became an inevitability. Following the conclusions of the First World War came changes in economic and immigration policy which fundamentally transformed the nature of the American identity. People who came through Ellis Island were not sufficiently American in spirit, they were Italian or Irish or some form of other. Those of Hispanic descent were likewise restricted from ever embracing the label American by a feverish white cultural segregation, even though many Hispanics had lived in America for generations. In 1924 came new immigration law, the Johnson-Reed Act, legislation which imposed upon America racial quotas for immigration, and altogether excluded Asian immigration to the country. In practice, the country with the once warm and welcoming Ellis Island became, by bureaucratic fiat, a white ethnostate. This was a time in America when there were two Americas, a white America and a non-white America. In 1929, global catastrophe struck in the form of an economic depression. The Roaring Twenties ended with a whimper. Now was a time of great economic hardships, isolationism, and racial resentment. Jobs became a scarcity and were exclusively reserved by capital owners on the basis of being a true American. Welfare was introduced to stave off greater economic hardships and to alleviate unrest. This system was not without its burdens. And knowing this, the government of the United States engaged in a campaign of deportations of Mexicans as a means of providing relief to these systems. These repatriation campaigns similarly captured Americans of Mexican ancestry and saw them deported to lands that were foreign to them, lands they'd never been to or lived in. Approximately one million people, U.S. citizen and non-citizen alike, were deported to Mexico during the Great Depression. 60% of all people deported at this time were American citizens of Mexican ancestry. These were people with the right to live in this country who were disappeared by policy, unpersoned by virtue of heritage. It was then in the 1930s that the racial classification of Mexican changed. Divisions have always existed, but for the purposes of the census, Mexican always denoted whiteness. The census made no distinction between these categories until 1930, when the Depression hit. The racial classification of mixed-race persons defaulted to non-white by federal law, regardless of the degree of mixing. One drop of African blood denoted a person as a Negro. One single drop of American Indian blood denoted a person as a Negro, unless the blood was in such sufficient supply that they could be classified as an Indian. And then, for the first time in American history, Mexican denoted a separate race as well. The peace is now aligned for the open hatred and resentment of hyphenated Americans. The culture regarded them as different, and now the government affirmed them as different. Between the deportations and the census, the pieces lay in place to justify the maltreatment of Mexican Americans. Their immigration was restricted, their citizens were deported, their rights were denied, and the culture of America had decided. Mexican was a dirty word. America exhibited more change than just ideals about nationalism and immigration. A shift in culture birthed counterculture movements, often repudiated or rejected for what they were perceived to bring, or from where they had originated. These changes brought a new sound to America, jazz, 
a style of expressionist music originating from black musicians in the South, and these changes brought with them their own distinctive style. The Zoot Suit premiered in the Harlem jazz scene in the 1930s, and eventually traveled west across the country before making its way to LA. A Zoot Suit was a distinctive outfit with pants high to the waist, and a long coat adorned with lapels with wide padded shoulders. Flashy and jazzy, Zoot Suits became popular counterculture clothing, bucking traditional conservative stylings and finding home with African American, Latino American, and Italian American communities. December 7, 1941 was a day to live in infamy, a day which signaled America's official entry into the Second World War after the Japanese surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. The American war machine was mobilized, and with it the inevitable decrease in labor as pools of Americans would be called overseas. Increased wartime production boosted the American economy, and labor shortages were met with migrant workers, many from Mexico. An agreement between the United States and Mexico to import migrant workers called the Bracero Program saw at least 4.6 million Mexican migrants come to the United States for work for the duration of the program's existence, between 1942 and 1964. Tensions grew with the forced internment of Japanese Americans and the draft pulling all other Americans overseas, and Bracero workers would do the manual work needed to satisfy the wartime economy. Anglo natives would then compete with Mexicans who moved westward for economic opportunities. As happens with any increase in immigration, or with changing demographics and culture, hysteria about change comes to reinforce notions preconceived by people who regard themselves as native or superior in some fashion. Los Angeles was a Spanish city, as if the name was not a giveaway, and at one point it belonged to Mexico. However, despite this historical claim, communities of Mexican heritage which lived in Los Angeles for generations were segregated by neighborhood and school. These communities were often molested and dissected by city planners paving the way for Los Angeles civic expansion projects. In 1940, the city exercised the power of eminent domain to amputate the Chavez Ravine from the people of traditionally Hispanic makeup which had occupied it, and in its place came the construction of the Naval Reserve Armory a naval training school which would base and grow the naval servicemen who would eventually come to define the many clashes in the LA area. Parts of Chinatown were likewise seized and reappropriated to construct the LA Union Passenger Terminal. This expansion was justified by a total media disregard for the segregated people living there, with them often being regarded as pachucos. Pachucos was a term to describe a Chicano subculture spanning Juarez all the way to Los Angeles. Denoted by the ostentatious zoot suits many would wear, but derisively also associated with petty crime and delinquency. Many newspapers of the time would describe a crime wave associated with Pachuco culture, and invariably the zoot suits which went with it. One article written in the Tucson Daily in April of 1943 remarks that the link between the zoot suit and social depravity had not yet been disproven, that the zoot suit was the uniform of hoodlumism. An October 6, 1942 article written by the Evening Sun remarks a correlation between zoot suits and violent crime. A September 4th article from the San Francisco Examiner goes on to remark that zoot suits were a badge of unpatriotism. A May 25, 1943 LA Times article has a headline which reads, Four zoot suit gangs beat up their victims, describing a reign of terror inflicted upon peaceful citizens at the hands of zoot suit wearing thugs. Pachucos, discontent with the confinement in the world inside their barrios, would often venture into the downtown Los Angeles area, and engage with the nightlife there, but so would the sailor station there as a result of the expanded Naval Reserve Training School. Ground zero for the clashes were the neighborhoods of Alpine Street and Temple Street, which connected with Figueroa Boulevard, an area collectively part of the Chavez Ravine. Sailors and zoot suit wearing pachucos would frequently clash in small brawls all throughout this area, eventually forcing the Navy to declare 30 different bars and taverns as off limits in downtown for sanitary reasons. Every week, some 50,000 servicemen poured into the Los Angeles area while on leave, and clashes with the Mexican youth became more frequent. The clash of young white sailors with zoot suit wearing Mexican youths would be an unstoppable object colliding with an immovable force, and violence continued to escalate between the two groups as media sensationalism continued to complement these clashes with negative press for the Pachuco youths and their zoot suits. 
On August 1st, 1942, a fight broke out at a water reservoir called the Sleepy Lagoon, a youth hangout spot near Williams Ranch in East Los Angeles. Mexican youths were not permitted into then-segregated public swimming pools, and so the Sleepy Lagoon Reservoir would become a popular alternative. The day after the fight, the body of Jose Diaz was found near the watering hole where the fight had taken place. Dubbed the Sleepy Lagoon murder by the media, attention and speculation fueled the general public regarding the perpetrators, with the police rounding up some 600 Mexican youths and a sweeping spree of arrests connected to the murder. The police eventually settled on the indictment of some 22 youths who could be placed in the Sleepy Lagoon area that night. Among them was Henry Levas, a frequent with police. Levas and neighborhood youths who were at the swimming hole were dubbed the 38th Street Gang by the media, and the circus surrounding the incident signaled the impetus for the coming riots. The trial was a kangaroo court, which ended with three defendants being convicted of first-degree murder and being sentenced to life in prison. Nine others were convicted of second-degree murder and were handed sentences ranging from five to life. Another five were convicted of assault with a deadly weapon with intent to commit murder. Jose Diaz was indeed at the party where the brawl had broken out, but, per court transcripts and witness testimony, had left the party before the brawl had ever taken place. Nonetheless, the men were forced into some rather peculiar mandates by the trial judge, Judge Freak, who denied permission for the defendants to consult with their lawyers, except during court adjournment. The hallmarks of the ceremonial lynchings, as described by Kerry McWilliams, manifested further when the court would not permit any of the defendants to remove their zoot suits or to get a haircut. Clean clothing was denied the defendants at the behest of the prosecution, and the defendants would be described as wearing the appearance of an unkempt vagabond. From this point forward, I'd like to have read from the book The Zoot Suit Riots, The Psychology of Symbolic Annihilation by Mauricio Masson, as I think it does a far better job of capturing the peculiarities of the trial than I could ever convey to you. The Sleepy Lagoon case gained fame for the extraordinary judicial procedures used and the bizarre nature of the evidence brought before the court. One of the stronger efforts to discredit Mexicans came from Lieutenant Edward Duran Ayers of the Sheriff's Department in testimony before the grand jury. Ayers presented a discourse on genetics in making a case for the racial determinants responsible for Mexican juvenile delinquency and violence. He directed the grand jury's attention to the oriental background of Mexico's pre-Columbian ancestors, underscoring their mutual disregard for human life. The Indian, from Alaska to Patagonia, is evidently oriental in background. At least he shows many of the oriental characteristics, especially so in his utter disregard for the value of life. Referring to Aztec human sacrifice, Ayers added, This total disregard for human life has always been universal throughout the Americas among the Indian population, which, of course, is well known to everyone. Ayers completed the syllogism connecting Oriental atavism with Mexican violence in the United States with the following. The Mexican authorities have stated that which we are learning the hard way. The Mexican Indian is mostly Indian. And that is the element which migrated to the United States in such large numbers and looks upon leniency by authorities as evidence of weakness or fear. Or else he considers that he was able to outsmart the authorities. Ayers displays his own anti-structural and anti-institutional leanings by recommending dispensing with due process. It is just as essential to incarcerate every member of a particular gang, whether they 10 or 50, as it is to incarcerate one or two of the ringleaders. His most ambitious proposal was to advise and favor retroactive punishment. The time to rehabilitate them is both before and after the crime has been committed. Mexican youth were to be kept in a state of perpetual liminality, always marginal and bereft of social status. This eternal infantilization was applied by implication to all Mexicans of all ages. Ayers drew on metaphor to illustrate his point. Although a wildcat and a domestic cat are of the same family, they have certain biological characteristics so different that while one may be domesticated, the other would have to be caged and kept in captivity. And there is practically as much difference between the races of man. Another example of Ayer's partiality for feline allegories. In fact, as mentioned above, economics as well as some of the other features are contributing factors to Mexican delinquency, but basically it is biological. One cannot change the spots of a leopard 
On January 12, 1943, the trial concluded, and the verdict found all 22 men guilty of one or more charges. The media trial, however, had concluded much earlier, with many of those being tried described as uneducated, belligerent, filthy, and delinquent, and media antagonism had peaked. The December issue of Sensation Magazine published an account of the murders, as well as a full report on Mexican gangs in the LA area. Vigilante action was high during the trial, with the targets of such action overwhelmingly being aimed at Mexican-American youths, not just in East LA, but all over the city. May 31, 1943. Twelve sailors and servicemen engaged in a violent clash with Pachuco youths in the downtown Los Angeles area. Joey Dacey Coleman, one of the sailors, perceived a threat when passing the Mexican youths and grabbed one of them, and a subsequent brawl broke out from there. The sailors had lost the conflict and returned to the Naval Reserve Armory to rest. A few nights later, on June 3rd, around 50 sailors left the armory armed with weapons, some makeshift clubs, and meandered into the Alpine Street neighborhoods. On the hunt for zoot suit wearing youths, the mob walked into nearby Carmen Theater, where several Latino youths were. Fights broke out and many youths were dragged from the theaters and beaten, with their clothing torn off by the mob and haircuts forced onto them, some of them as young as 12. This same night, another group of sailors claimed an attack on Main Street by zoot suit wearing pachucos, where the mob would then descend and assail any Mexican people they could find. As the fighting broke into the next night, roughly 200 sailors used a fleet of taxis to invade East LA neighborhoods, where the mob would swarm local Mexican residents with a barrage of attacks using makeshift clubs and chains. Few arrests were made, with most of the detained sailors being released and most of the beaten Mexican youths arrested. The section of the police which directed their apathy to the mob dubbed themselves the Vengeance Squad a group of police officers who believed in the use of heavy-handed violence to rid Main Street of zoot suit crime. Several nights on, mobs of sailors and citizens would set upon Mexican youths in East LA neighborhoods, where more were beaten, robbed, and raped. Thousands more servicemen joined in on the violence over the ensuing days, with violence becoming randomized against any Latinos they could find, regardless of the outfit worn. Police were under orders not to arrest rioting servicemen, Instead, they targeted Latinos, with 500 being charged with rioting and vagrancy, and 150 more being injured by the mob. An account of the event, as witnessed by journalist Kerry McWilliams and later included in the Citizens Committee report on the riots, reads as follows. Marching through the streets of downtown Los Angeles, a mob of several thousand soldiers, sailors, and civilians proceeded to beat up every zoot suitor they could find. Pushing its way into the most important motion picture theaters, the mob ordered the management to turn on the house lights and then ranged up and down the aisles, dragging Mexicans out of their seats. Streetcars were halted while Mexicans, and some Filipinos and Negroes, were jerked out of their seats, pushed into the streets, and beaten with sadistic frenzy. LA City Council responded to the riots, not by indictment against the sailor mob beating youths with clubs, but instead by banning zoot suits from being worn by city ordinance. Rioting continued for several days thereafter, with more beatings and mob brutality being directed at Mexican youths. Then, on June 7th, by order of the United States military, servicemen were confined to their barracks, and Los Angeles was considered off-limits to all military personnel. In all, counting the previous outbreaks of violence, there was 10 days of rioting and violence with hundreds of Mexican youths being injured or hospitalized, and more being arrested. By mid-June, the fighting had subsided completely. The Zoot Suit Riots, as they were dubbed, concluded. Mass arrests, dragnet raids, and other wholesale classifications of groups of people are based on false premises and tend merely to aggravate the situation. Any American citizen suspected of crime is entitled to be treated as an individual, to be indicted as such, and to be tried, both at law and in the form of public opinion, on his merits or errors, regardless of race, color, creed, or the kind of clothes he wears. Group accusations foster race prejudice. The entire group accused want revenge and vindication. The public is led to believe that every person in the accused group is guilty of crime. <laughs> 
It is significant that most of the persons mistreated during the recent incidents in Los Angeles were either persons of Mexican descent or Negroes. In undertaking to deal with the cause of these outbreaks, the existence of race prejudice cannot be ignored. On Monday evening, June 7th, thousands of Angelinos, in response to 12 hours advance notice in the press, turned out for a mass lynching. Marching through the streets of downtown Los Angeles, a mob of several thousand soldiers, sailors, and civilians proceeded to beat up every zoot suitor they could find. Pushing its way into the most important motion picture theaters, the mob ordered the management to turn on the house lights and then ranged up and down the aisles, dragging Mexicans out of their seats. Streetcars were halted while Mexicans, and some Filipinos and Negroes, were jerked out of their seats, pushed into the streets, and beaten with sadistic frenzy. If the victims wore zoot suits, they were stripped of their clothing and left naked or half-naked on the streets, bleeding and bruised. Proceeding down Main Street from 1st to 12th, the mob stopped on the edge of the Negro district. Learning that the Negroes planned a warm reception for them, the mobsters turned back and marched through the Mexican cast side, spreading panic and terror. Throughout the night, the Mexican communities were in the wildest possible turmoil. Scores of Mexican mothers were trying to locate their youngsters, and several thousand Mexicans milled around each of the police substations and the central jail trying to get word of missing members of their families. Boys came into the police station saying, Charge me with vagrancy or anything, but don't send me out there! Pointing to the streets where other boys, as young as 12 and 13 years of age, were being beaten and stripped of their clothes. Not more than half of the victims were actually wearing zoot suits. A Negro defense worker, wearing a defense plant identification badge on his work clothes, was taken from a streetcar and one of his eyes was gouged out with a knife. Huge half-page photographs showing Mexican boys stripped of their clothes, cowering on the pavement, often bleeding profusely, surrounded by jeering mobs of men and women, appeared in all of the Los Angeles newspapers. What was just read was an excerpt from the Governor's Citizens Committee report on the Los Angeles riots, dated 1943. The commission established in the aftermath of the riots by Governor Earl Warren, intended originally to provide political cover for the LA area police and servicemen, but instead being shunned by the very authorities who commissioned the report. Fletcher Bowron, Los Angeles mayor at the time, dismissed the report's conclusions and instead laid blame against Mexican gangs for the violence. And on the subject of Mexican youth gangs, the 38th Street Gang saw their convictions overturned on appeal, with Judge Frick's numerous remarks made during the trial, in addition to his segregating the defendants from their counsels having been seen as prejudicial. Henry Levas and the rest of those convicted for the murder of Jose Diaz in what became known as the Sleepy Lagoon murders were freed. The impetus for the race riots of 1943 was overturned on appeal, and the case remained unsolved for many years thereafter, until 1991, when Lorena Encinas confided to her children that her brother, Luis Encinas, was the person responsible for the beating and killing of Jose Diaz that night. Luis Encinas was never convicted, nor was he ever tried for the crime, and 22 innocent men paid justice on his behalf. None of this mattered in the grander narrative. Newspaper clippings at the time laid the blame on the victims of the mob, and even though the committee responsible for determining the cause of the violence concluded racial animus to be the primary motivating factor, few at the time would accept these facts. Racial tensions between Latino communities would continue to drive American racial policy in negative and tormentuous ways. In 1955, as many as 1.3 million Mexicans and American citizens of Mexican descent were deported in the largest mass deportation campaign on U.S. soil, an operation known as Operation Wetback. The short-lived operation relied on military tactics to sweep up and rapidly deport Mexican migrants, as the original purpose of the campaign was to assist the Mexican government by complying with the Bracero program. Many of those deported would die in the cramped and inhuman conditions as they journeyed to Mexico some by sunstroke, and some by drowning in capsized vessels. If you're an actual human being with a sense of empathy, you might find the brutality of Operation Wetback deplorable. The idea of deporting citizens and non-citizens alike based on racial animus, an operation which killed by heat stroke, drowning, and poverty. You might declare that such ideas should be relics of the past, a time from when America was ignorant and afraid. You might think that the Zoot Suit riots would plague our collective conscience about how culture begets racism and rhetoric begets violence. You would hope we're past this, but you'd be wrong. Moved a million and a half illegal 
immigrants out of this country, moved them just beyond the border, they came back. Moved them again beyond the border, they came back. Didn't like it, moved them way south, they never came back. One would hope that the decades-long history leading up to the race riots in 1943 would inspire a sense of responsibility and egalitarianism, and that we'd all learn from our pasts. But I just showed you the current president of the United States praising a deportation program named after a racial slur, which saw the forced expulsion of over a million people, some of whom were citizens, done to cheering crowds who justify the maltreatment of Mexicans by a total disregard for their personhood. Yesterday's pachucos are today's illegals. It is no exaggeration to say that the discourse surrounding complicated social issues like race and immigration are painfully surface level. There are many complicated issues surrounding the debate in modern America which should be informed by our best efforts to collectively understand the nuances of history. But the arguments are lacking substance, arguments which assert that the solution to ending racism is to deport all other races, as there can be no racism without other races. You know what else could end racism? Deporting all the racists. It's equally as valid an answer. I hope that when the president floats the idea of adding a citizenship question to the census, that we have a sense of pause about what the actual purpose of such a question is. I hope that cramped detention camps on the border shock your conscience. I hope that when the president praises deportation programs which caused untold suffering on over a million people, that we all remember our history. I hope when the president remarks that Mexico is sending us rapists, we think on the Zoot Suit riots and the lessons we should have learned from it. Those lessons being that violence and unrest are simply the inevitable outcomes of racism. Yeah, but I'm not interesting in these. I'm not interested in these options. I, I made love to hundreds of women, close to a thousand perhaps, and to each of these women, I would stay with them until they leave me. I was always ready at all moment I've put my dick in a woman to live the rest of my life with her, because I'm loyal and I descend from a line of loyal males who have made loyal nations, who have made loyal families, and that's just how I am. I, I seek not to improve my position in the marketplace as I am engaged with a fertile female. I'm satisfied by her, and I want to make our lives and the lives of our children better. Well, I mean, on the face of it, that sounds quite noble.